Check, check. Okie dokie friends, gonna get started in a second. Hello, happy Sunday, my friends. How are we doing? Um, welcome to Zine Dreams. It's a stream all about independent and commercial printed media. How we come together, how we curate it, how we print it how we cut out the paper. It's all fun stuff. Um, today we are going to talk about Put an Egg on It, issue number 15. This is the 10th anniversary issue. It's quite large, so it's going to take a significant amount of time to go through. Um, we're looking at a Kickstarter zine, or it was funded on Kickstarter. It's called Homeworlds. And then a commercial product that put out a zine, like a little one. It's called How to Use Okazu by Abokichi Inc., which is a Japanese company. Fun. How are we doing? How are my friends out there? Hey, good morning. Good morning, Lucius. Good morning, morning Martin. Good morning, Matt. Ah, you're making lunch. Great. Always happy to hear about lunch. Do you guys hear me okay? Some music, like, fine. Whatever. So, uh, this is Sunday stream. I also stream on Wednesdays when we talk about food, but today is all about printed stuff. Very casual, very unplanned. Uh, lots of links under this video to support the channel. You can also subscribe or attach your Amazon account to Twitch, and you get a free month to support any creator on Twitch. Hopefully that's me sometimes, but you can switch them off every month. Like, I have a subs subscription to my friend Bijan, and I have a subscription to my friend uh, Matt. He goes by Meklo, which is very exciting. Um, so, yeah, you can, you can rotate your subscriptions, which is super fun. Uh, let's get into it, since this issue is really, really big. So, put an egg on it. Tasty Zine number 15. This is on sale in the store still at put an egg on put an egg on it no a n it's put a egg on it you can see there's no n on the cover um this is my friend aura aura weiss uh she is a huge huge activist and food person in new york city if you don't know her um please get familiar with her work she's amazing um and always knows what to say <laughs> someone who's so full of life and fun, obviously. Um, 
But this was a big undertaking. As the editor at large, I am in charge of a lot of projects, but um, this issue was really, really fun because we had the biggest recipe section we've ever had to edit. And so um, it's the very first time we've used the actual theme of eggs in any of our magazines. So we've had 15 issues so far, and this is the first one where we actually feature egg recipes. Because it's not, Put an Egg on It, the magazine is not about eggs, but it's about that ethos of throwing eggs on things, improvisation, comfort food, and enjoying yourself. Um, but I mean, how could we go 10 years without talking about eggs themselves? So <laughs> uh, this was really fun to put together. Um, so our opening page here is a bunch of charred vegetables. And we have a food tip. Glabrous garbanzo. For an extra smooth hummus, drop an ice cube or two into the food processor. Make sure to hold on for impact. The lid may try to slip off as the ice hits the blades. And that was a tip for me. I curated all these cooking tips. Um, there's this really funny illustration of an ice cube going, ah! And I'll read you our letter from the editor. This is from Simon. Ten years, OMG. Put an egg on it began ten years ago in my kitchen. We had no plan at all except to help people tell their stories through food. One of the most fulfilling and gorgeous things about these years is the community of food people and magazine makers that has been growing around us. This issue is much heftier than usual. It's a celebration, a chance to expand the kinds of stories we're able to tell. We were able to recreate a famous meal from history and go through Perkle Jones and Ruth Marion Barouche's archive of photos of the Black Panther Party in Santa Cruz, by the way. Our recipe theme is pickled, so please go there for pickles and more. Love you all. Happy birthday to us. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not, <laughs> it's not about eggs. It's another issue. This one's pickled. I'm so mistaken. Um, we have a lot of really cool contributors in here. Ricardo Roa, who is a photographer. Uh, recipes from Chitra Agrawal. Uh, Lee DeRossier. Who else? Andrea Nguyen, Emma Orlo, Jessica Russ, Marcus Samuelson, who has a restaurant up in the Bronx, my friend Jeff Stockton, and uh, Matthew Tilden from Scratch Bread. Uh, okay, we got a recommended product here. When making their hot sauce, Brooklyn Grange, the largest New York City rooftop farm, is concerned with tasting their gorgeous peppers first and foremost. The hot sauce is a nice vinegary zip that makes it good in fatty cuts of pork, but you're not... Oh, that makes it good with fatty cuts of pork, but you're not tasting that first like you would in Tabasco. Ooh. Yeah, so Brooklyn Grange is a local farm, and they have a hot sauce. They actually sell at my far local farmer's market which is really exciting. Who did the hummus illustration, you ask? Let me see. Oh, the hummus illustration? This was all by Ralph. Ralph McGinnis, who is our co-founder. Uh, we also have a comic here by Ben Passmore called Aunt Dementor's Literal Soul Food, and it has, like, a Dementor going, scream! Aunt Dementor's soul food. It's funny. We have a poem here by Mermaid Avenue to Kings Highway by Amanda Deutsch. <coughs> Mermaid Avenue to Kings Highway. She never learned to speak English without an accent. Carried it with her through the streets of Brooklyn to make dinner and pharmacy. Oh, to, to every diner and pharmacy, every supermarket and dance hall. Years later, on her King's, at King's Highway plastic-wrapped pea-green colored couch and armchair for company, my grandmother held onto her roots, never speaking much of heritage or holocausts or who she left behind. Every item preserved in a heavy sheet of plastic, furniture, clothes, money, memory. Every dress, shirt, coat in the hallway closet saved for a special occasion, a half-full candy dish of coffee hop jays besides the plastic-choked armchair for guests that never came. Whoa. Poetry. 
Yeah, I also love the illustrations. It's great. I have a page here um, that I, I produced called Try This. And it's stuff a pork loin with a delicious paste. We suggest any pesto or combination of nut, semi-soft or hard cheese, and a savory herb. For example, two pounds of pork loin, quarter cup of almonds, eighth pound manchego cheese cubed, two cloves of garlic peeled, one bunch of fresh sage stem removes. And then it's a step-by-step -step of stuffing a pork loin with like a spiral pattern when you cut into it. It's fun. Uh, we have a excerpt here from Christopher Morley. If buying a meal were like buying a house. This indenture between A, B, and innkeeper, organized and existing under the laws of good cooking, party of the first part, and C, D, party of the second part, with witnesseth that the said party of the first part, foreign in consideration of the sum of dollar fifty, law lawful money of the United States, paid by said party of the second part, does hereby grant and release unto the said CD and his heirs, administrators, and assigns forever. It's basically a contract if buying a meal were like buying a house. <laughs> we have a munch about, which is our feature where we ask somebody to take us around a neighborhood, and this is with Michael Musto. I'll read you the first little bit here. I met Michael Musto at the Trader Joe's near his apartment on a snowy afternoon. We wandered the aisles and discussed his methods of shopping on a budget. He buys the same things at each place and pays attention to the prices. More than one employee stopped him to say hello. We finally got out after the crazy Trader Joe's checkout line and started the process of unlocking Michael's bike. He's an all-weather rider. I was impressed as I'm a total wimp. As we shuffle through the storm together, walking his bike to his house, he points out neighborhood places he likes to frequent. Um, walk to walk and McDonald's among them. He apologizes for his pedestrian taste and we pledge our love for McDonald's fries. It's too shitty out for a walking tour, so I buy us slices, pizza slices and soda and we head up to his apartment instead. Fun. Michael Musto. Pizza slices. Um, we got product recommendations here. Better made chips. Ever, has anyone ever had that brand, Better Made Chips? Detroit has been known as the Motor City, Motown, and the Arsenal of Democracy. The latter comes from Detroit's contribution to the Allied efforts during World War II. The biggest city in Michigan also has a lesser-known nickname, the Potato Chip Capital of the World. Did you know that, Detroit? The average Metro Detroiter consumes roughly seven pounds of potato chips a year, three more pounds than the rest of the country. Whoa. So this is a family-sized bag of better-made special original potato chips. Yeah, I never heard that before either. Um, let's see. Is there anything about it? Yeah, anyway, those are, those are potato chips. Um, has anyone ever had Tasty Cake Candy Cakes with a K? Candy Cakes with a K. Peanut Butter Candy Cakes. A small circle of vanilla sponge cake, two inches in diameter, topped with peanut butter and enveloped in milk chocolate. The Tasty Cake Company touched heaven when they invented the candy cake. Has anyone ever had a candy cake? I've definitely heard of Tasty Cake. This is what it looks like. But I've never had a candy cake. Oh, you grew up with it? Oh! Uh, across Delaware Valley, apparently. Cool. Makes sense. Okay, we have an art feature on Entremp and Entretempo Kitchen Gallery. It's based in Berlin. On a tree-lined street in Berlin's historic Prenzlauer neighborhood, Entretempo Kitchen Gallery stands in contrast to the century-old buildings that surround it. Warm light and buzzing patrons spill out from the modern space many weeknights. The latter discussing whatever immersive sensory experience they've just undergone at the long focal table in the intimate space. In one of the gallery's most visited exhibitions, visitors partook in a menu of water frozen in frozen vaporized fermented and jellied forms, while artists examine pollution in life and wombs through sound and light installations. We're all, we are almost all water, yet we are unlearned to understand water, the description read. Wow. Artist, chef, and curator Taina Guedes found, 
found the gallery in 2014 to showcase the work of artists dealing in sustainability. Oh, fascinating. Oh, they had a waste-free restaurant installation at Food Art Week 2007. Dope. I like that. Okay, we have a photo spread from the Black Panther's Breakfast Program. Um, we sourced these photos from the Black Panther Archive in Santa Cruz, California. Did you know that existed? In 1968, the Black Panther Party organized one of the first free breakfast programs for children in the United States. With their survival programs, the party aimed to provide and support social systems to help black and impoverished people. First operated out of a church in San Francisco, by the end of 1970, the program had spread to multiple cities and was feeding over 10,000 students every day before school. That is amazing. Wonderful. Children really shouldn't have to pay for school food. Oh, look at this. These are such great photos. Photographers Perkle Jones and Ruth Marion Baru rejected the biased and one-dimensional way the Black Panther part Party was represented by the media and sought to capture the humanity and hopefulness of the people involved. Taken on May 20th, 1969 at St. Augustine's Episcopal Church, these photographs were commissioned by the Swedish magazine V and were never published. The gentleman in the white apron is Charles Bursey. This story was made possible by a grant from Danielle Smith and Elliot Wilson, photo courtesy of Special Collections, University Library, University of, Sa of California, Santa Cruz. Nice. Mm, cuties. This is from Simon. It's called, I love those. I'll read you a little bit here. I vividly, recall, I vividly recall a conversation I had with a few of my new classmates on the first day of high school as we hung out on a side street just off campus. The trees over our heads filtered the sunlight onto our faces and my new vans felt really new. How old are you? One of them asked the other new kid standing next to me. When they heard it was his birthday. Fourteen. Everyone laughed. You're just a baby. I froze. I was a full year younger than he was, having turned 13 just the month before. I kept my mouth shut, hoping they wouldn't ask me the same question set about proving to the world that I was old enough to be there. It helped that I was a quick study. When I lied about my age until I was 21. I'm sorry, Carrie, I wanted to tell you. <laughs> Lovely story here. Um, we have an essay by Marie Salome Peronel, A Traveling Feast first paragraph. I had never seen a bowl of guacamole overflowing with so many herbs in its silky green. Kathy's Fifth Avenue apartment was fragrant with cilantro, scallions, lime, and lemon, and I could smell that they were freshly cut. She bought them three blocks from her apartment at Union Square Farmer's Market. As I got to know her better, I learned that buying organic flowers, bread, and vegetables there was part of a weekly routine. To copy her, it became part of ours, too. New stores were added to my grocery shopping paths, such as Union Square Market, a small butcher in the West Village, Russ and Daughters, or Lifetime, her favorite organic store on 6th Avenue. Even my mom shops there every time she visits us in New York, giving her the feeling she's almost a New Yorker. Isn't that lovely? Hey, Lucius, which um, farmer's market? Yeah, that's your, that's your market? Cool. Yeah, mine is McGolrick. Um, which is happening on Sundays, so today. I actually just went today. I'm looking for mackerel, and no, no fish butcher that I know has mackerel right now, which is sad. Uh, we get a food tip here called wrapper refresh. Don't let those dumps dry out. When working with dumpling or egg roll wrappers, place a damp, wrung-out paper towel over the stack to prevent them from drying and cracking. And that also applies not just to wonton wrappers, um, but uh, dumpling wrappers and egg roll wrappers. Just a damp paper towel will help you uh, keep them soft. Um, we also have a section here about our installation slash exhibit. I've never actually gotten to conduct one before because of COVID. Um, we were planning some really large scale international installations. Um, but it's called, if I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. 
and uh, Simon and Ralph have traveled to Africa and London and Japan to do this installation. So basically what they would do is take over a gallery space and make meals. And in exchange, uh, to pay for the meal, pe people have to tell us stories and we record them. And so um, this is what this is about. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. A simple trade, a meal for a story about a meal, a space for sharing time and conversation over a home-cooked lunch, chance meetings made more intimate by introducing food. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake as a traveling art installation with three parts. A few days spent cooking and sharing stories in the kitchen, a pop-up shop of small batch foods and independent magazines from cities we visited, and an art show, the subject of which based on the type of space available. We've done cake project in Tokyo, New Orleans, London, and Cape Town, and have plans in the works to bring it to Mexico, Colombia, California, Nigeria, and beyond. Ah, I really want to go. Um, yeah. One of the most wonderful aspects of this work is learning about people's lives and families and cultures through the relationship with food. We see common threads as well as major differences everywhere we go. So here are highlights from, from all of the installations that we have done. Let's see, John Borte and chicken adobo for fried brains. John Borte, an R&B and jazz singer in New Orleans native, came by to see us. I made us a pot of chicken adobo and a lettuce wrap with ground pork, red onion, cilantro, and crushed up hot nuts from the corner store. John had a steak before he came, he came over. Don't worry, he said when he saw my nervous face. I can eat, baby, trust me. <laughs> That's fun. Okay. This is great. Okay, so we have another feature called Dinner Conversation where we invite three different artists from dif three different disciplines and generations to talk about art and life, um, and we record their conversation. And um, this is really exciting because I know one of the people in it. Um, Azikwe Mohammed uh, is my friend and a former co-resident at Kickstarter. Um, so I did an artist residency at Kickstarter, and Azikwe was in my class, like my cohort class, and so is Mike Regnetta, who I'm on a, a podcast with. Um, but the other people are Gerwin Gorostiza and Sarah Schulman. I'll read the introduction here. <clears throat> Erwin Gorostiza, our gracious host, has been testing his dinner menu for weeks. He's had multiple tasters over and text me his updates. By the time I show up to help prep, my excitement is high. Edison, our newest egg associate, who also has been in this chat a few times, um, is already there making himself useful, chopping the yucca. Sarah Shulman is the first to arrive, and I'm a little awkward because her work means a lot to me. She is a writer and activist and AIDS historian. I read her books, People, I read her books, People in Trouble and Rat Bohemia, on my way to New York City after high school. Erwin's apartment is stylish and comfortable, and he's already got a few cheeses out with almonds that he soaked overnight in olive oil and Spanish paprika. Azikwe Mohammed comes in just as Erwin and I realize we forgot the potatoes and the appetizer. Disaster averted. Azikwe and Sarah are already talking by the time I join them. Sarah asks him what kind of artist he is. Multidisciplinary? A performative installation artist? Question mark? He offers that he's an artist who creates spaces for people on the margins in an attempt to make things less shitty in the world. And I can attest to that. Azikwe is uh, an elemental artist being, um, he was resident at Pioneer Works in Red Hook in Brooklyn. And uh, a lot of, I don't know, yeah, a lot of his work is enveloping. It has to do with music. It has to do with sculpture. It has to do with commentary and just so much stuff like, He's one of those artists you can't really define, but you know he's an artist, you know? <laughs> Don't you know people like that? Yes, so they have a long conversation here. That's my friend, that's, that's a sequin. Ah, okay, little feature on food writing. I'll read the, the beginning here. In 1938, Archie Mayo directed The Adventures of Marco Polo, a Hollywood film, starring Gary Cooper as the Venetian merchant. If we can offer the, him, offer the film any bit of credit besides depicting the state of Hollywood in the 1930s, it is as the origin of the call-and-response game of tag that cuts the adventurer's name in half. Marco, Polo, Polo, Polo. 
So it was like an essay about um, film and call and response and food writing. Ah, this was a really fun photo shoot that we did. It's called Burned. Um, I love the story behind this. Like, Ralph explained it to me like three times, and I was like, how are we going to do that? Um, but uh, here, I'll read this to you. Burned. We live in a burning, apocalyptic time. Unless we abolish single-use plastics and paint each strip steak of asphalt brilliant white, Climate change, soon to be as hot as hell, or in New York City terms, hot as hell's kitchen, which is not yet that hot necessarily, but it's very near to the spot from where, uh, from where one socialite, Miss Dorothea Arnold, is known to have disappeared, i.e. crisped herself into the air, exactly five years from the date of an extremely charred supper she hosted at her East 79th Street residence, one otherwise undercooked May Eve 1905. Dorothea loved fire. In fact, she wrote a short story called The Poinsettia and the Flame. When the story was point blank rejected by McClure's magazine, she burned it up in her stove. Such is life then in Manhattan when we all want to be somebody. Then again, Dorothea was already somebody. So say the gossip pages from the New York Journal who reported the infamous supper. Fed up, New York City socialite burns friends. Society com columnist Charlie Knickerbocker writes, in a microfiche recently slipped under our put an egg on it oven door, making it incandescently clear, Mrs. Arnold's culinary offering was not only a society snub, but a Michael Wolf level flambéed roast, and they ate it too. So the story is this woman um, kind of like broke up with her friends by serving them an entirely burned meal. And so we have a photo shoot where we try to recreate or imagine what those dishes were. Can't incinerate the soup? Singe the shit out of the croutons. <laughs> Given its liquid nature, soup is obviously harder to burn than other things. You have to really want to do it. We have little background info on the raison d'etre behind Dorothy and Arnold's feelings of discord toward her guests but are impressed by the thoroughness of her no-dish-left-behind approach. We do not know that Mrs. Arnold was a graduate of Bryn Mawr College and born under the sign of cancer, uh, born on July 1st, 1880, making her just under 25 years old. That night, she scorched the, scorched the toasts. Yeah. So it's a walkthrough of a whole burned meal. Burn! Okay, we have a feature here called Microcosm Publishing by Linny Crawl. When the team at Microcosm considers a book for publication, they ask 20 questions. Does this empower the reader to create the kind of life they want and to change the world around them? Does it help to remove barriers to success for marginalized people in our industry? With food books, they also ask, does this book challenge popular narratives about the subject? Few Microcosm cookbooks are just cookbooks as a result. Wow, cool. Yeah, it is a badass way to tell a group of people to piss off. Invite them to your home and feed them terrible food. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. It'd be such a waste. Maybe I would invite them to a place that was empty. I think that's less wasteful. Kind of mean, though. Um, so there's a bunch of books from Microcosm. Uh, Think, Eat, Act by Raffaella Tolisetti. Or The Culinary Cyclist by Anna Brown. This very Portland book was born over green juice is shared between biking enthusiasts. That's so funny. Biking and baking. I kind of want that book. Did I freeze, my friends? Or is it just my, my stream? Let me know. If, if I froze, I can uh, restart. Or I'll just re reload my browser. Basic Fermentation, uh, Make Your Place by Rally Briggs. Um, oh, and then we got a puppet feature. Like, how can we ever uh, incorporate food and puppets? But we found a way. Puppets by Miss Pussycat. Got these food puppet pu puppets that are uh, cooking. Look at these puppets, they're having a meal. Here's the words. Here we go. 
Christy Cornpop and Bitsy cooked a beautiful vegetarian feast in their home in New Orleans. Their friends, Pinksy Princess Diamond Sky Riverdance, Rhodes and the Goblin Cake joined and a festive evening was had by all. Highlights include the Pau de Quejo seared avocado with Creole spices and a Burmese tea leaf salad. So it's the puppets having a dinner party. It's funny. Puppets and set by Panacea Pussycat. Food by Carmo and Daniel Boyle. Produ production assistant by Aaron Porter. We have an essay from Max Blagg called Kale Tail. On a bright morning in early spring, I fingered the wrinkly sea green leaves of the kale on sale at the farmer's market as if they were fine barathea, but at two seventy five a bunch, I decided instead to inoculate my beef stew with a cheaper green, the dependable collard. Kale, which I've eaten rarely except in the occasional stew, evokes for me nothing in the kitchen, but rather conjures old November mornings in Middle England. On Saturdays during the pheasant shooting, October 1st through February 1st annually, I would get a day's employment as a beater for the local landowner, pretender, pretender to a non-existent baronetcy. Interesting. Kale tale. Uh, we have an essay from Linda Sparrow, who is Simon's mother. And I, jokingly on Instagram, always call her mother also whenever she <laughs> comments on any of my Instagram posts. It's the fall of 1969, and I'm living in Isla Vista, the student ghetto just outside of UC Santa Barbara, affectionately called Sin City. Rents are high, houses barely holding together, and landlords are decidedly absent, but we don't care. We've crammed four of us into a small two-bedroom a block from the beach, and we are free, free of parental restrictions and university authority, free to do whatever we please. We share most everything, what little money we have, clothes, drugs, wine, cars, and even an occasional lover. Whoa, Mom. Whoa, Mom. <laughs> What's up? Um... We also have a photo feature of Mimi's Queer Industry Night, Brooklyn. So there's a place called Mimi's Diner, and they had a queer industry night, and we went along to take photos of people who were there. So it was fun. This is Edison, who has been in the chat with us before. This is Edison's folded face. Um, let's see, do I know anybody else in here? Um, that's Simon. I don't know if you can see Simon. That's Simon. Uh, Mimi's Diner in Prospect Heights is a queer-owned restaurant with a comforting, friendly vibe and great food. Each month, they host a party for fellow queers who work in hospitality. We crashed the latest one with photographer Noah Fex. By, by the way, Noah Fex. I didn't, I've never said that out loud before. I didn't realize it sounded like the band N-O-F-X, but his real name is Noah, N-O-A-H, and F-E-C-K-S, Noah Fex. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Um, yes. This is my friend Bibinka Mama. She's a bio queen drag artist. You can follow her on Instagram. She's amazing. She also literally sells Bibinka, which is a Filipino rice cake. Drag and Bibinka. Great combination. We have an essay here from Jessica Craig Martin called Beans on Toast. The announcement swept through the boarding school with a velocity singular to catastrophe. Our Monday meals were to be eliminated in order to send the savings to those less fortunate. Less fortunate? How could anyone be less fortunate than we, who were losing set one-seventh of our roast spuds, sausage cakes, and crumbles? We were appalled to learn that the architect of this calamity was one of our own, no less, a student who had been visited by the charitable impulse. She had stood up in a school meeting and single-handedly brought about the unthinkable, a day without bacon. <laughs> That's funny. Henceforth, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we were served beans on toast. I actually never tried that, beans on toast. Has anyone ever tried beans on toast? Okay, we have another essay here by Cooper Lee Bombardier called Short Order. In 1993, I moved to San Francisco and my life was soon bookended by breakfast. Oh, I like that sentence so much, bookended by breakfast. I parked myself at the Bearded Lady Cafe and found a community. Not long after, I landed a job as a short order cook at Just For You, a dyke-owned cafe at the peak of Potrero Hill. 
These two queer cafes anchored my new life. It seemed every queer in town hung out at the Bearded or made their way to Just For You or something homemade to plug up a hangover. My days were steeped in coffee and my nights drenched in beer and the aperture between my morning and evening beverages, which was free of stimulants and sedatives, was narrow. The euphoria of finally finding my people, my place in San Francisco, propelled me further from grief I was attempting to outrun and buoyed me through delirious days of flipping eggs, flirting, fucking, and making art. I was 24 years old, post-punk and pre-trans, full of big-eyed wonder at the miracle of finally making my way to the queer holy land where so many of the writers and artists I admire were based. Not only did they live in San Francisco, they've moved among us. People just walking down the street, drinking coffee, doing readings at scruffy art spaces, or drifting past in the shadows at play parties or nightclubs. Wow. What a wonderful little beginning paragraph. Okay. We got another food tip. Totalize tuberously. Is your dip a little thin? Blend in a peeled boiled potato for more weight and spreadability. We got lots of blendy uh, food tips in this issue. We got another photo spread called Al Sharesh, Al Sharesh Algiers by Abdo Shanan. Here is the paragraph here. Where's the paragraph? you find the paragraph I want to tell you about it well it's a meal being prepared in Algiers oh this baby look at this baby hi baby oh here uh Shaharazad Assam Asaya Leia, Yasmin, and Abdel Rahman are eating Al Sharesh and Al Rak together, celebrating Yenayir, the Berber New Year in Algiers. Got it. Yee, look at this baby! Hi, baby! I can't believe it's fed through this issue. This is a very big issue. Okay, now we're at the pickled section. This is all the recipes. We got pickle packing Mama Sherry's hot garlic dills from Carter Wilson. Taiwanese cucumber pickle from Linda Xu. Beet pickled turnips from my friend Jessica Russ. Pickled herring from Marcus Samuelson, who owns uh, restaurants up in the Bronx. Pickled silver mullet from my friend T.S. Strickland, Terry Strickland, who lives uh, down on the Gulf Coast. We have a photo of the pickled ahi dulce. Syrian pickled cauliflower from Emily Pastor uh, is reprinted from the Joys of Jewish Preserving book. Uh, pickled ahi dulce from Stephanie Haramino. Uh, Zucchini pickles from Heidi Swanson. Kombucha notes from Simon. Meyer lemon pickle from my friend Chitra. Doreen's pickled mango from Arnold Hiyoyura, which is a, a Hawaiian author. Bacon nachos from Ford Fry. What else? Pickled scotch egg from Matt McClure of McClure's Pickles. Three cord chilies from Paul Gerard. Recipes for when you're in a pickle from Emma Orlo. Uh, fermented tomato paste from Lee Durossier. And hot sauce mustard pickle from Matthew Tilden. Exciting. Oh, there's so many more. Green, and green tomato and lemongrass pickle from Andrea Nguyen. Ethiopian honey wine from Sandor, Sandor Ellis Katz. Tabikos water kefir from Christy Dahlia Home. And then my friend Jeff, who is expecting a child this fall. Um, citrus chai shrub. I'm very into the whole in this whole idea of closed loop cocktails or trash tiki. So finding ways to reuse, reuse leftover citrus was very important to me as we get juice a lot at Golden Eagle. We get a fair amount of calls for mocktails, so I love the idea of a cordial with some depth that could be used for our non-alcohol drinking patrons. With some lovely chai tea via direct trade company Rishi, we found a versatile and punchy citrus cocktail that was great for a bunch of different applications. Ginger pulp is used is from making in-house ginger syrup as well. Use all the things. We have one final food tip here in the magazine called Coddled Carrot. Before pickling root vegetables, parboil them until they are fork tender. Imagine what texture you'd want to bite into. 
So that goes also for potatoes and any hearty root vegetables if you want to pickle them. It is possible to pickle those, but uh, just make sure that you're making pickles of things that you want to bite into. <laughs> and then our end here, let's see. We have an ad for McClure's Pickles, and you know, we don't really have ads, so I developed a recipe using their relish. So it's a pickled burger, pickle-flavored burger. Can you see it? Pickle up for summer. Oh yeah, and then so for our last feature here, the last couple pages, is um, a timeline, uh, history of food according to us and our family. Uh, let's see, what did I write? Here we go, my history of food. Jen De La Vega's mother asked her to wake up at 6 a.m. to help cook Thanksgiving. When the 16-year-old awoke with much difficulty, her mom had gotten called into work and left instructions with a 7 p.m. deadline and the, good, and the words, good luck. <laughs> yeah, so we asked people in our community to uh, give us like a two-sentence, like how did you discover cooking or how did you get into food? And then our final page, we uh, have a feature on our friend Maria Mercedes Grub, who is executive chef in, uh, she used to be executive chef of Gallo Negro in um, Puerto Rico, but she has since moved on. She's actually in New York right now, I think. She's doing pop-ups and like cooking in the Hamptons, but this is my friend Maria. She's great. And then we have a picture of a fridge. And our final illustration on the back, scrambled love. Scrambled love. And then here's our binding, a beautiful binding. This is a very thick issue. We are at 161 pages. Crazy. But that was put egg on it, issue number 15. Uh, we're almost catching up to the publication, the, the, um, the current publication cycle. So the last one we've published in mass was number 16, which is next week's issue. Um, but that's it. That's, that's on sale in our store. We love it. Um, okay. We're going to move on. Oh, Lucia says, I'm tickled by all these pickles. Me too. Such pickle. Um, we're going to move on to this, this print zine called Homeworlds. So, um, let me drink, take a drink of water. Let's put an egg on me also. <laughs> Let's take a drink of water also. Smart, right? So, I'm very close to the company Kickstarter, like literally, like not only do I support a lot of the things they do, and my, a lot of my friends used to work there um, before the big layoff, um, but they are physically located close to me. Uh, they, their office is based in Greenpoint, and I live, that's where I live. Um, every January, they have this initiative called the Make 100, where they challenge everyone to kick off the new year by making a hundred of something like it can be something small it can be something big but it has to be a hundred or attempt to get to a hundred things and that's where a few of my art projects come from so i had a make 100 eggs brunch party where um, whatever tier that you backed on the kickstarter that's how nice your egg was so you could get yours fried you could get your sous vide you could get yours with truffle so it was really fun to like put together as many eggs as we could it really challenged me as a chef and then allowed the people that were there to be super creative and then i also did um the super nacho bowl was our attempt to make 100 kinds of nachos uh that was really fun we got closer to uh, I don't know. Did we make? Uh, yeah, so we made like 48 kinds of eggs. We didn't get to 100. Um, and I think we got to like 60-ish kinds of nachos. Um, I'll make more attempts in the future to make 100 eggs and 100 nachos. But it was, it's, it's such a great learning experience um, trying to make 100 of something. But, okay, so Homeworlds, I'll read you the page here, is a limited edition set of 20-plus postcards featuring an imaginary alien landscape created by Mike McCubbins and Matt Bryan. So I'll scroll down here. Uh, Homeworlds is a postcard tour through 20-plus alien landscapes in collage. All images used come from a single source. Yoshikazu Shirakawa's landscape photography book called Eternal America. 
Shirakawa's book is a full breathtaking and unconventional views of the American West. Um, they digitally remix these bold images to create new and imaginary vistas that speak to the strangeness and estrangement of the American p political climate. So yes, um, I have one of the post, one of the twenty postcards. Actually, I have two. I have another one hanging in my room that I can't really take down, but this is the one of them that I got. This is another one. Let's see. Uh, okay, postcards have a long tradition of mixing the real and the fantastic to capture the allure of far-flung locales. As I started working on these images, it became clear that I was using them to telegraph a sense of frustration and dread. These are postcards from hostile territory. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, so the zine. So I got one of the limited edition zines. Let's see. Why, why, why isn't there no um, thing about it? This is 20 page. Oh, so I got a print. So the zine is just all 20 of the postcards in zine form. So I got one actual postcard that I can use and then all the prints in a zine. So this is very gorgeous. I was really taken by it when I saw it. Yeah, the design is amazing. So we get open it up here kind of looks like a uh, New Mexico ish doesn't it I like the limited colors too makes it really um, if uh, I don't know 3d ish comic booky and this one's on its side Ooh, these are cool look at all this texture so much texture Wow. This is perfect because it goes well with uh, the podcast mini series I'm on right now. We're using the game Still Fleet, which is set 100 million years in the future. And this is like good to like think about what kinds of worlds are we going to discover? Are they hostile? Are they friendly? Can we breathe? Can, do we need like spacesuits? These are things I have to think about now. Amazing. Mm. Yeah, it's really cool to use red and blue, like, you know, like the political colors of the two major parties. It's freaky. Woof. This one with that volcano, it's like chilling. Oh, I love this one. Looks like lava river flow. That one's like real, real Japan vibes. Even though these were all taken in the Midwest. Still Fleet seems really cool. Yeah, it is. There's a quick start guide on their website. Um, for us, it seems really overwhelming because the world is so wide and that there's so much possibility. But um, it's super fun and really easy to pick up. You gotta like get out of your human brain. You gotta remember that you're another species. If you choose to play another species, you can still play a human, um, but they're less common in that world, which is quite a, kinda crazy to think about. Okay, I think we're at the last page, or oh, last two pages. I have this one. I have this one in my room. Look at that sky. And here's our last page. Ooh, this pink canyon thing with the Saturn. Looks crazy. And here's the back. Cool, so this was Homeworlds, originally a postcard set. 
but made into a zine for people who like to consume things like that, like me. And this was by um, Mike McCubbins and Matt Bryan on a Kickstarter project. Yeah, these are good prog rock album covers. All right, all right. I really like it. I like it so much. This is my, my postcard. <laughs> you have a lot to say about the design of spacefaring RPGs, but you don't want to hijack my stream. Oh, fair. Fair, fair, fair. <laughs> um, our last zine wasn't really uh, found in a traditional sense. Like, So I go to a lot of food trade shows for, for work, and I am a judge for the Specialty Food Association. And so they are um, all about... I guess, exposing uh, uh, buyers, like people who buy food or decide what is going to be on the grocery shelves of like specialty food shops. Um, they market to those people uh, all these new and international imported goods. And so every year I get to go to fancy food show and taste through about 20 2200 booths it's like the size of seven football fields at the javits center and um i've developed ways to like sort of not get full <laughs> from all the snacking and and it's like costco on steroids you know there's like samples of every little thing and uh, i like to focus on savory snacks cheese and condiments and so uh and there are also alleyways that are country themed or ingredient themed and so one of my favorite alleys to visit during these conferences is japan alley um and i discovered this condiment called okazu it's from a company called abokichi and um you know a lot of food companies they throw all this money into marketing and like swag they give you like stickers like this is controversial but i have like a goya magnet rip Goya. I used to buy Goya all the time because it was affordable, but now that we know that, that he's, they, su they support the president, um, screw that. <laughs> no more Goya. Um, but yeah, a lot of companies, they, they use marketing budgets to buy uh, koozies, straws, like whatever the hot thing of the moment is with merchandise. And I was really taken by this by this Japanese company Abokichi because not only did they have a condiment um, that looked really good, they had this tiny zine. It's only one sheet of paper, and it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six pages. You see, very simple. Um, two staples on the binding. Very very easy. How to use Okazu. Japanese miso chili sesame oil condiment. And this is an illustration of it. I think this is an excellent way to market your, your um, kind of indie uh, food product. Okazu is a Japanese-inspired sesame oil, miso paste, and spice-based condiment. Traditionally, is eaten with plain rice. And then they have a little... Yeah. Who would have known Goya would be canceled? I know. It can also be enjoyed in other rice dishes, in an onigiri rice ball, in fancy maki rolls, or fried rice. This is adorable, isn't it? Okazu is also great on other kinds of carbs. Bread, potatoes, pasta, pasta with potatoes inside. <laughs> Pierogi, gnocchi, baked potato, pizza, rotini, grilled cheese, mac and cheese. Isn't that cute? I love it. You can cook with okazu. Marinate chicken or fish or grill or bake. Use it in a stir fry. Try it on just about anything. Stuffed mushroom crap, uh, caps. Try it on just about, oh, uh, not, not on ice cream. I disagree. I think you can have that stuff on ice cream. Tofu, burger. These are really cute watercolors. And you can tell it's a watercolor because of the texture of the illustrations. But then printed on black and white with like inkjet. And some people just put it on a spoon. The end. 
Very easy. Very small. Very cute. Yeah, so I was really, like, taken by this company. Like, you can tell that their values are, like, creativity and um, DIY more so than a lot of their, like, commercial counterparts. You know, like Goya. Um, but yeah, that was How to Use Okazu by Avokichi. I have yet to get a, a jar of it. I've tried it. It was very good and, and savory. Uh, I'd love to have it on cold noodle. Oh, cold noodle right now in the summer sounds so good. Anyway, so that was How to Use Okazu. And then we also looked at Home Worlds. It was a Kickstarter project. And then we looked at the big honking issue of Put an Egg on It, number 15. Um, let's see. So I'll be back to stream on Wednesday at 5 p.m. And we're going to talk about, I feel like we determined all of the things we want to talk about next week. Food preservation. That's a really big subject. Martin suggested it. Pickling with Lucius and then cookies. So yeah, more noodles. Oh man. Okay, I'll put noodles at the bottom here. Noodles. Yeah, it's so fun. Like, it's preserving is just such a large, large subject. So hopefully I'll cover a lot of ground, and then anything we don't address, we'll have on another stream. So yeah, happy Sunday, everybody. Thanks for spending your morning with me or a early afternoon with me. Um, have a great, relaxing rest of your day. I hope you get some rest and some sleep and have a treat. Stay cool. It's going to get about get up to about 93 here in New York. So I'm staying inside. I already did all my errands this morning. So, um, yeah. So I'll see you on Wednesday, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. Bye.